check out this rare, never before seen interview with Steve and Connie Ray Andreas. Stay tuned. Hey, this is Damon Karp from NLP Gym on this scorching hot day in Santa Cruz, California. If you haven't already, please click subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can get these videos on a regular basis and make sure you click the bell so you get notifications when I put new videos out. I was in Colorado at Stephen Connie Ray Andreas's house and I had the privilege of interviewing both of them at the same time. I have not seen an, inter an interview with both of them at the same time. I looked all over YouTube and so that's why I'm calling this a rare interview. So very happy to be able to bring this to you. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is the sound isn't great. There is a stream that runs behind the Andreas house and for some reason my microphone decided that this was the most important sound to pick up. So it really brings out the sound of the flowing water behind it. I know what you're gonna think when you watch the video, video you're gonna say, why did he choose to do an interview right there? Okay, it didn't sound like that when we were recording. So now that you know this, please refrain from putting comments <laughs> at the bottom saying, oh, this is a great interview, but the sound sucks. I know it sucks, and I apologize for that. I will know better in the future. Just enjoy the interview. The captions will be turned on, so just flip the little, click the little button for the captions. I will do better in the future. 40 years of NLP. Over 40 years of NLP. Yeah, I guess that's it. More than 80 years between the two of them. Yeah. <laughs> I hear some people. I think we got him. Uh, what was the thing going into transformation, or what was the, why was that the focus um, of your work? Well, I've got an answer, but why don't you? Uh -huh. huh? mm -hmm. well, one of the things, a lot of people try to add something in, and if you start with what someone is doing already, that is a, a response to a bunch of some kind of environmental cues or interactional cues or something like that. If you then transform that in some way, then what you transform will respond to the same cues. So it's better than just, if you try and build something brand new, then you have to fit it into the system. But if you're using the person's response to, to what's going on already, it's already embedded in the system and then you transform it and then it leads somewhere else. So instead of going where it used to go, now it goes in a new direction. So that's one answer. Mostly I just like the word there. <laughs> I think I, uh, when I named Core Transformation, um, I also just like the word. Something about it intuitively just felt like it fit what the process was. and. Uh, and yeah, we've been using it to describe a lot of the, the way we approach things. And I think it, for me, it's because um, transformation suggests a more across the board shift in way of being perhaps. Not just, it's not just we're solving something, um, we're transforming things. So it's a more fundamental shift and more changes. We're taking this same essence, the same being, and um, it's not like things are completely different, but what was there isn't going to be thrown away. It's going to be transformed. Yeah. It's going to be there, but different. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. I love that quote. <laughs> well, there's another, another start for transformation. When you were working on the hypnosis book, we had the idea of trance. Formations, mm -hmm. formations of trance. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the structures of trance? Yeah, that for that Nate, for that book title, that was. It was perfect. It came from trance. <laughs> yeah, like anything, not one particular model or but something that you created in an LP that you're most satisfied with. Did that answer for it. Okay, I, it, it's two things really. It's the core transformation work and the wholeness work. Those I. Um, have experienced to most completely work for me and um, have the most significant results with other people. And especially now the wholeness work, 
the car transformation work has been around for quite a while. And I, uh, when I came, when the wholeness work came to me at first, I was thinking, well, maybe I don't need car transformation anymore. Maybe the wholeness work will do everything. Um, and I came to see that wasn't true. Um, that that car transformation has an important place in my view. Um, with the same in the same genre of work that wholeness work is, car transformation um, has a significant place. So I like the both of them, and and they they are what has worked for me personally. So that makes a difference to me. Is that pick between the two very both significant? Well, I don't think one can pick between the two because I think oftentimes work with core transformation helps pave the way for people to relate to wholeness work more completely and more effectively. So oftentimes it's too big of a jump to go straight to wholeness work. And if people have some grounding in core transformation first, it, they get more out of it. So I have to admit though, with, with when I have new clients, since I'm really into testing wholeness work and seeing how far I can go with it, I tend to start there with everybody, almost everyone. And then I find, though, that with um, most people, if I add in some teaching of the, the core transformation work, then come back to wholeness work, they get more out of it. So what's your most? Well, I like the self-concept model. It took a long time to develop all the different aspects of it, so I think that's the one I'm most satisfied with. But also uh, the... Uh, Transforming negative self-talk books. Those are very concrete and specific and useful. In particular, the one in the second book where it's basically you can take any internal voice and run it through this stepwise process and come out with a nice transformation. So that's nice too. I'm reminded of the story of the songwriter who was asked, what's your favorite song? He says, the next one. Whatever I'm working on at the time is the most interesting. Was there, was there any uh, big project that you wanted to do that you hadn't started work on? Or you'd like, you or is it more of a process for you where you just, you're discovering something and that it sort of creates itself as you discover it? Or do you set out to like, okay, this is what I want to do? No, it's more following up leads. Like what you just said before that. The building, the discovery. Yeah. Being curious about something and getting a hint of something and going into it a little further and a little further and a little further. And sometimes dropping it for years and then coming back to it. The self-concept stuff started 12 years before I published the book. But it was just a hint. And I didn't follow it up right away. And then I started following it up more and more and more. And we research seminars where I'd invite people in for real cheap experiment and do what Bamberger used to call instant research on a group of people and give them some exercises to do and find out what the results are. So it's more a process of discovery. Mm -hmm. What I set out to do was find something that I didn't know. <laughs> so it's, the story of this is in, I think it's in the introduction to Core Transformation too. Um, the book, in, in the introduction to the book. The way that came about, um, I gave myself the task of just finding a method that would go farther, that would go deeper, that would get more pervasive change. And the reason was that I was finding that things weren't working for me. What was already known wasn't very effective for me. And so I thought something, something needs, is, something must be possible that works better than what we know. So I um, set out the offer to people um, that if you have a life's biggest issue and you've already tried all kinds of things to get a change and nothing has worked, then, and you want to work with me on it, also we can do a session. And the only thing we'll agree on in advance, the only thing um, I know in advance is that I won't do anything I know to do and that you can go home when you have what you want. <laughs> That's what I tell people. And, um, so we'd sit down and the, the very first person that came in with that, I started off using language patterns and tracking presuppositions, and, um, but very quickly the whole core transformation process just kind of fell out. Um, 
and fell into place and was asked going on this line of questioning and the first person ends up in this very powerful state and I recognized that this was a very powerful transformative state he was in so and it just seemed intuitively have the sense of what to do next with it and it just kind of flowed all in one piece um, and then tried the same thing out with the, once one person it had worked with one person then I then I patterned out what that was and tried the same thing with the next person and that worked with them too and so that was how the core transformation process unfolded. Now, looking back, I could see how um, the line of questioning, I had tended to go in that direction earlier too, sort of like Steve was saying, with positive intent in NLP, it was taught, we were being taught to go until you get to a positive outcome and then find new choices, that six-step reframing or the negotiation model. Um, but I always had this feeling that it would work more easily if I would go a few layers farther. And so I would do that with people, and then I would find it was easier. And then, with, so with core transformation, I took that really to its extreme, and went farther and farther and farther until people couldn't. So basically, not, go any not stop with the first positive intent. Yeah. So not keep stop going. with the, Keep going. Recursively. That's what resulted in that um, in that pattern. You guys want to talk about Erickson? Do you have any stories you want to relate about him? Do you have any questions? <laughs> you mentioned he had a few stories he was thinking of. Well, there's a couple that really stick in my mind. I, was, I only went down for about five days. Tiny Ray went for a second week. I went for five days, and I wasn't really able to track what he was doing most of the time. So it was kind of boring for me. Even though I, I give him his, his expertise and his skill and all the rest of it. But there was one time when he's, he said to the group, can you tell when someone's hypnotized? Which is a conversational postulate. And the, the literal answer is yes or no, or the more detailed answer would be in behavior. And I didn't know enough about what was going on to give a decent answer, but I knew that it was, I was gonna keep my mouth shut because I wasn't gonna stick my neck out. And a lot of people gave different answers about Spiegel sign and the eyes rolling up and the flaccid, flaccid cheeks and things like that. And after a whole bunch of people had talked about these different signs, he turned to a gal who was about th four people to the right of him, said, Mary, where are we? And this gal goes, up in the apple tree. And what's my name? Tommy. <laughs> he wasn't about rubbing her nose in our ignorance. <laughs> he, wasn't, he meant when he asked, can you tell when someone's hypnotized? He meant literally, can you tell right now that somebody's hypnotized? And he had such good feedback, he knew when people were hypnotized. I see a lot of people do, quote, hypnosis. And basically they talk a bunch and they never test or they never have a concrete way of knowing whether the person's actually in a trance or not. They just kind of do a bunch of verbiage and hope that it's going to be useful. And he didn't, he always had feedback. He knew when people were in trance or not. He knew when they slipped into trance, he knew when they slipped out of trance. And that gave him the power to do all those wonderful things he did. In the practitioner training, there's a story in there uh, about him wanting you to sign one of your books. Right. And you didn't sign books at the time, or that's, but you didn't like signing your books. It seemed to me kind of a meaningless thing, you know, you get, go to a movie star and you get the signature on a slip of paper. And it's, it's, later on I came to realize, well, it makes people happy, what the hell, it's meaning, I still think it's meaningless, but yeah. other people, but I, when, I, when I came across that in the practitioner training, I thought it was interesting because I'd asked you to sign some books that I had ordered uh, from some of the Transforming Yourself books, and you didn't hesitate with saying, okay, and you signed No, it. I got so, over it. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, there's another story that you um, sometimes tell about the about the favorite color or something like that. How, how does it start? The woman in purple? Yeah, the woman in purple. 
Well, most people who went to see him knew that it was the only color he could see well was purple, because he was mostly colorblind. And one day, we were there for five days, and maybe the third day in, a new woman came in, dressed in purple from her head to her toe. Literally, there was a purple bow in her hair, purple shirt, purple dress, purple shoes, purple socks, everything was purple. So about halfway through the morning, he said, you know, I'm colorblind, I can't see colors very well, but sometimes I can sort of guess what colors are. And he started, let's say that this woman was over here on the left, about three people to the left of me. Erickson was here. There were four or five people around the circle. So he started over here and he said, you know, I think you've got a plaid shirt and it's probably light yellow and maybe a kind of a gray, gray blue. And he went around naming, and he was right on. And he named colors of, of clothing all the way around the circle. He got to her and he says, but I have no idea what color your dress is. Would you please tell me? <laughs> and she looked like somebody hit her over the head with a sledgehammer. She just could not process it. It's, it's so contradictory to what she thought she knew. And uh, he took, took the, she dropped into a trance and gave her some advice about paying more attention to her own values and her own interests rather than either. She was obviously a people pleaser, even without the purple. With the purple, it was a done deal. She really liked to please other people rather than herself. So that was an example of him setting it up ahead of time, not just telling some hypnotic story or doing some language pattern or something, but setting up the whole situation, planning in advance exactly what he was going to do. And uh, that was part of his skill. He didn't, a lot of people thought he'd just wing it, and wing it and see what happened. And he was not that way. He was very, very careful playing. I think it's that combination that he, he was very, um, he made very fine distinctions and uh, fine observations and, and he planned things out really carefully. Um, there are stories about how he made a, a, an induction for somebody who was planning an induction. He started off with 50 pages and then reduced that to 30 and then reduced that to 15 and down. Sorry, Finally, out, started out 42 pages. Oh, 42. This is one of Steve Langton's books. Oh, okay. And he cut yeah. it in half each time. And then finally, what was the ending? Do you remember? Two and a half pages. Five, and then that's the so that shows how carefully he planned. Um, and then there is also my sense. You know, I don't know that much really, I, but my impression is that he also is incredibly good at adapting to the feedback in the moment. So because you, that's the part that you don't know. You can plan based on what you do know, but then you're there with the client and. Um, just a slight shift in how the client responses, responds and then one needs to go a different direction. Whether that's a little bit different or a lot different, you know, depends on the, what you get. But I think he had both of those. And a lot of times I think people who, are, who wing it and go um, intuitively don't have that precise planning capacity. And a lot of people who plan don't have that ability to flow with the actual feedback in the moment and, and make it go a whole different direction than the plan if it's called for. So he could do both. Steve was there one week, I was there two weeks, and I... I couldn't follow it. Um, it was a lot to track, you know. We, we could each track some things, but... Um, Every once in a while he'd pull a, pull a miracle out of the hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think, I, for me, the benefit was more personal than in terms of getting training. Both of you have done some work with Virginia Satir? Just a little bit, not much. She came to, she was a keynote speaker at... Um, 1985 um, conference. Conference that we had here in, in Denver in 85. Well, you can see what she's like in her videos. That's her. Very, very powerful. That's very, that's very, very powerful, very self-assured. And just with a kindness, and underneath kindness. Right. She just, very, there's that kindness about her. 
and and the power, both the power and the kindness. I think in a way, even though she she regarded Milton Erickson as kind of an evil hypnotist guy, is much is what I heard. Um, I think the two of them are quite similar in that way, that both of them had a kindness and a powerful presence. Was she very methodical as well? Or she, yes. Yeah. There's, a, there's a book uh, called Meditations of Virginia Satir. And if you read th through them, they're basically a hypnotic pattern, called hypnotic induction. She called it meditations, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I heard, I heard that before, and it was like, well, it was kind of the same thing that she was doing, and like, uh, Structurally the same. Different flavor. Structurally the same. Well, I hope you liked that interview. And like I mentioned, if you want these videos on a regular basis, make sure you subscribe to this channel and click the bell so you get notifications. Check out my website, nlp-gym.com. You can also follow me on Facebook where you'll get real-time updates on what I'm up to, trainings that I'm putting out there, workshops that I'm doing, or talks that I might be giving in your area. Also, on the website, I do have some free training. I have hypnotic inductions that I get for absolutely for free, so make sure you take advantage of that. Take care.